Hey kids, so as promised, I am back to talk about my tips for finding a good spouse. In this case, from the female perspective, looking for a male. Sorry, non-heterosexual people, you'll have to try another channel. Um, so this is Husband Hunting 101. So the first part to my advice is you could broadly characterize as know thyself. I think that is pretty good advice for pretty much any decision that you're trying to make in life. So even if you're not looking for a husband, you might want to sit down and think through some of these things because it's going to be relevant in choosing a career. It's going to be relevant in deciding where to live, what you do with your time, all kinds of things, uh, who you let in your life, which is a broader category of who you pick as your spouse, of course. Um, so the first major component to look at when we're talking about finding someone that you're compatible with for a long-term romantic relationship is personality. Um, personality is a pretty complicated topic, but I don't think you need to understand it in a huge amount of depth in order to make good decisions about it. But one thing to understand is personality is pretty well fixed. Um, it may be significantly genetic and maybe entirely genetic. Um, I suspect it's something like 60% to 40% genetic and the rest of it is something that develops, but it develops so early in life, um, probably before age five, maybe even before age two, um, due to environment and your choices in response to that environment, that it's basically not something you're gonna be able to change later in life. You may as well treat it as fixed. Um, so get a good handle on your personality. Um, and some good tools for doing that include the Big Five personality test, which uh, Jordan Peterson now has one. You can take a test online very easily to figure out where you score on those categories. Um, Myers-Briggs is a popular one. I find that pretty helpful too. Um, I'm also a big fan of one called DISC, which is used more in the business world and has more to do with communication style. Um, but all of those, I think, basically come together to help you understand you know, what type of person you are, and then you can use that to kind of map onto what kind of person would be a good partner for you. And there are some areas where you wanna find someone who's very similar to you. Um, there's others where you, know, you don't want too much overlap of, of being exactly the same. Um, and then there's also the male-female dynamic to consider. Um, so for instance, in general, a heterosexual couple will be happier if the male is more masculine than the female. When you look at the big five, you'll see the traits that tend to be stronger in males and the traits that tend to be stronger in females. Um, these aren't by the way, things that are good versus bad or anything like that. They're just traits. Um, but in general, a woman um, who you know tends more toward the masculine end of the spectrum is not gonna be happy uh, if she pairs up with a guy who is more toward the feminine end of the spectrum than she is. Um, and similarly, on the other on the other end of things, right? If there's a guy who's like rather on the feminine side of things, he should look for a woman who's even more feminine um, rather than try and compensate for you know, those missing skills by looking for a more masculine partner. Um, so not a case of opposites attract, in other words, in that case, uh, or at least not in both directions. So one of the major categories of information that a lot of these personality tests are looking at, um, and certainly that the big five pulls out pretty directly, is the emphasis that you place on emotion versus reason and logic. Um, and these roughly translate into males tend to be more on the reason logic end of the spectrum, females tend to be more emphasis on the emotional end of the spectrum. Um, this is an area where you can see significant conflict in relationships. Um, you, <laughs> if you, for instance, have a woman who is like very far on the emotion end of the spectrum and, you know, not super into the re reason logic side, and then you have a man who's like, you know, an aspiring Vulcan or something like that, they're really, really not going to have a successful relationship. They're not going to be able to communicate because their basic frame for how they understand the world and what they think is important um, in terms of um, what kind of information you should prioritize uh, is just, it's too far apart. 
Um, but on the other hand, like I said, you generally would want your masculine, the masculine half of the relationship, you know, the male half of the relationship to have more of these male traits. So if you're like me, for instance, and you're very, very far toward the logic and reason end of the spectrum and very far away from the emotion end of the spectrum, then it's important to settle with someone who is like even further down that spectrum than you are, right? Which is exactly what I did, which is part of the reason why our relationship works very well. We're in general trying to communicate from basically the same sort of place. Now that sort of crosses over into the second major category, which is values. Um, we talked about that before in the first video about how we met. Um, the values themselves are of course important. Um, it's very hard to even figure out what your own values are. Um, I'm not going to go into in depth about how you do that, but it's the kind of thing that I recommend putting a lot of um, attention and focus on, at least especially in the early part of your life, say if you're like early 20s, something like that. Um, but it's not just the values themselves when it comes to picking a long-term partner, because unlike personality, the values will change over time, um, especially if you're trying to compensate for something when you're young. Um, so sometimes your personality, you could react to aspects of your personality that will cause you to adopt values that aren't going to actually stick in the long term because they're not that compatible with the type of person that you are. Um, so what's more important than that is a system for determining values. Um, and that is something that I was very explicitly looking for um, when I met my husband. I noticed very early on that I could meet people and I'd, I'd almost call it superficially agree with them. Um, like we would be in alignment on so many points. It would be like, here, we agree on this, this, and this thing in politics. You know, we like this, this, and this thing in art. We like this, this, and this thing in, uh, you know, in terms of lifestyle. And um, we think this and this and this about religion. We'd have all these things lined up, um, but it was still really clear that we weren't getting there from the same place. So there was something deeper that was different, right? And while those conclusions, you know, maybe your opinion about politics, um, a particular issue might change over time, if the root that you're starting from when you're trying to figure out what position you want to take is the same, then you guys are going to stay much more in alignment um, going through life. And then even when you're not in alignment, I don't think it's as damaging because you have respect for the other person's process and how they came to the conclusions that they came to. So essentially, I always put it down to process versus outcome. Um, I think a lot of people put emphasis on outcome. I see this in a uh, um, in, in the political commentary space, for sure, people get very excited about people who just agree with them on the outcome. And then down the road, they end up having some major disagreement and they get really emotional and upset about it and they split. And it would have been obvious from the beginning that you guys were not really on the same page if you had paid attention to not just what that person believed, but why they believed it, how they came to that conclusion. So uh, process again over outcome. Okay, the fourth category is attraction, and it is impossible to overstate how important this category is. This is another thing that I'll see people, especially people who are really concerned about being virtuous, which I applaud, um, but who won't reflect honestly on what attracts them sort of in their heart of hearts. Um, that's another thing that, you know, it's like personality. It's probably pretty fixed. Um, you can change what you're attracted to and in some cases if it's really pathological you need to do the work to do that but that's a long-term process um, you know kind of that's like a five years plus in therapy kind of thing to change and like constant effort um, so if you're not in a situation where you find yourself you know constantly attracted to things that are really bad like you're attracted to drug users you're attracted to criminals something like that you're attracted to people who abuse you you know physically or emotionally if you're not in that state if you're just sort of a normal person and you're like oh you know here's this really great person you know why aren't I attracted to him I, I should just go be with them anyway because they hit all these other points. They hit all my values. You know, they seem like they should be personality compatible, all that. Um, don't do it. <laughs> just don't do it. Um, you know, the attraction thing is not something that you can fake. If you're not experiencing it with this person, at some point down the line, you're going to experience it with someone else. And if you're not experiencing it with your partner from the get-go, you're not going to be strong enough. Like, you're just not. There's, there's a limit to human willpower. Um, there's a limit to 
how well you can kind of isolate yourself and control your environment if that's even healthy. Um, so you need to be really honest about what kind of things attract you and just be okay with that meaning, you know, there are some people who are really good people um, who are not going to be the right fit for you. Um, and, you know, the same goes the other way. You have to have respect for the other side of the process, right? Like you could be a really great person and, you know, there's a, a guy who you think you guys would be perfect together, but you're not his type or something like that. You know, you need to respect that. That guy's doing you a favor because uh, the same thing applies on the other side. Now, that said, I don't mean to imply that you should be holding out for someone who seems completely perfect and, you know, you um, do get this initial um, sort of rush, like people talk about puppy love, right? Um, but it's different hormones, and I've talked about that before, but you should definitely look into the different love hormones, understand how they all work. Um, so I don't just mean like this mean like attraction to this person means you're going to be excited about them all the time or that you're excited about every aspect of them. Um, but fundamentally, for the most part, you should be attracted to them very like very strongly right like you should be very very into them um, especially at the beginning because it's not you know it's unlikely to get stronger after the beginning um, as the hormone balance kind of changes right um, so it's okay of course to say like well here's a list of things that attract me the most like for instance I prefer blondes my husband's not blonde it's a complete non-issue. <laughs> it wasn't even a little bit of an issue at the beginning, right? Um, but if I was going to kind of like draw like my, you know, ideal like looking looking guy, you know, it'd have an awful lot of what my husband has, but like he'd be blonde, eh, whatever, who cares? <laughs> that was a complete non-issue, right? Those are the kind of things that I think it's fine to let go by the wayside. Um, but, you know, if there's something where it's just like the person is not physically attracted to, attractive to you in any way, just don't, you just can't. So the last broad category I call compatibility. This has cover, this kind of covers a grab bag of other things, um, including lifestyle and career. You know, if one of you is planning on joining the military and, you know, being deployed all the time and the other one of you, you know, always envisioned a life where, you know, husband comes home at five and you cook him dinner and whatever, then, you know, even if you're fit on everything else, maybe that's not the right decision. Maybe it's going to be too far from the life that you envision for yourself. Um, the intelligence is a really, really big one. I've mentioned that before, but it's pretty simple. I would just recommend get yourself IQ tested. Um, if you don't get to the point where you're familiar enough with IQ to assess another person's IQ just from kind of interacting with them. Um, ask someone else their opinion. Um, you can you definitely fall in love with people and think they're a lot smarter than they are. Um, so it's good to try and get some objectivity around that. You can try and look at things like grades. Uh, grades. SAT scores are a good one. Um, you can find charts that map SAT score to IQ. Um, so you're basically looking for someone within 15 um, IQ points of you, um, or 16 if you're on the Stanford Binet scale, whatever. Um, but basically within, you know, definitely within two standard deviations, so within 30 points, but um, I would say try to be plus or minus 15. Um, I hear pretty frequently that women are happier with a guy who is more intelligent than they are. Um, I don't know, I just hear that a lot, but I don't hear it from women. Um, I mostly hear it from men, and, and I'm not sure. I mean, it makes intuitive sense to me, given hypergamy and marrying up, all that kind of thing, that women would, in fact, want that. Um, I... So if, if that's you, that's another thing to me, just, you know, reflect and be honest about it and then be objective in your assessment, you know. Um, I'm not saying give someone an IQ test on a first date, <laughs> it's a little tacky, <laughs> but, um, you know, you should find a way to get that information, um, you know, before you uh, make a make a hormone-fueled decision that may not actually be right or, or based on accurate information being processed. Um, and it related to the IQ thing is how competitive you are um, and then what that means um, for how a relationship functions for you. So in my case, I am highly competitive. Um, that's, not a fem that's not a feminine trait. Uh, there are an awful lot of men who don't like women who compete with them. Um, and that's totally reasonable. Um, I think that's more common, you know, than not. Um, so that's one thing to... Um, think about, I guess it's going to kind of narrow your field of choices if you are very competitive. Um, or there's a question of, even if you're a competitive person, do you want to be competing with the person who's your partner? So in my case, I very naturally, very easily fall into this competitive streak. And as a result, I, you know, I gave some thought early on. Um, there were some 
you know, men who caught my attention in my own field. And, um, you know, in, in thinking about it and reflecting about it, I'm like, okay, would I actually want to be with someone who is directly doing like a similar or the same thing that I do, um, you know, intellectually or for a living? And I decided, no, that I didn't, I really, really didn't want to do that um, because because I'm so competitive, because I thought that that would um, kind of soil the relationship that would turn into um, me getting mean um, or maybe, you know, they're not as keen to compete with their partner. Like most people don't really want to compete that uh, certainly not that fiercely and something as fundamental as career, especially especially for men. Right. Because career is like the center of like their sense of self-worth and their contribution to the family, even if they're not literally the provider of the family, that tends to be sort of how the psychology is mapped. Um, so I really didn't want to put myself in a position where I was like constantly challenging, um, you know, my husband in the category of like, of like his career. Um, so I intentionally sought someone out who was also intelligent, also competitive, um, similar to me, but operating in a different arena. And so sometimes we cross paths. Um, we actually shared one major. Um, so we have our times of being competitive with each other that we both find fun. Uh, but when it comes to our career, they're totally disparate. Um, and, you know, we don't have any um, even reason to compete in that area. And lastly, there's a question of the sexual market value match, which I've talked a little bit before in the hypergamy video. Um, essentially, you're not going to be very happy if you marry out of your league, and that applies for women as well as men. Um, it's a little tricky because, of course, women can get men of higher status to sleep with them, uh, but not necessarily to date and marry them. Um, so women tend to have an inflated idea of where they sit on that scale. Um, so you're not really thinking about like, oh, what, how attractive of a guy can I get to sleep with me? It's how attractive of a guy can I get to actually long-term date me or settle down with me? Um, I actually recommend, as I mentioned in the other video, that women try and date down a little bit in SMV. Um, I know that's hard. I'm not saying everyone will be willing to do it, um, but I think it's a good idea because male value tends to go up over time. Um, their value is based more around resources and less around attractiveness, uh, like physical, you know, youth and beauty, that kind of thing. Um, so as they age, they'll if they're doing well, like they'll increase in value, whereas women just decline, decline, decline after their 20s. Um, so you'll spend more of your relationship sort of within a similar SMV range if you date down a little bit at the beginning. Um, I also really like to look for people who are undervalued by the market. Um, that was definitely something that I did deliberately. Um, so I was kind of looking at not quite like a diamond in the rough type of thing. Um, but I was looking for someone where, you know, I felt like I was seeing something that other people didn't, um, where there was like a lot of potential, um, in this person and, um, yeah, basically, uh, <laughs> kind of getting them at a discount, I guess, is, uh, you know, sorry, I was trained as an economist. My husband is too, so he's not offended when I say stuff like this. <laughs> Okay, so anticipating some objections to all of this. Um, people change is a common one, right? You can't make a good decision for the rest of your life because people change, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, they don't. No, they don't. Um, especially on that personality point, which I said is definitely set by age five. Um, that stuff's not changing. Values, if you focus on process rather than outcome, that doesn't really change. Uh, the attractiveness thing doesn't really change unless you have a psychological problem, in which case you should get therapy. Um, and to the other stuff that changes, I mean, the whole point is to change together. Um, and it's one of the reasons um, I mentioned when I was chatting with John Delarose, um, I actually think the young marriages, you know, marriages before age 25, like, like in my case, I was, I was quite young um, when I got married. Um, I think it's a good idea, maybe. I mean, you know, at the time that I did it, I thought it was a little bit reckless. Um, but, you know, your brain is still physically maturing up until age 25. And I am pretty convinced that um, my husband and I, you know, kind of being in that age um, bracket of like your brain's done-ish, but now it's like firming up um, kind of and going through that together has made us just like an amazingly good fit for each other to the point that there's basically no possibility of an outside threat to the relationship because there's no such thing as a person who's a better fit for me than the person that I've spent 15 years with and, um, you know, we've, we've literally molded around each other, um, not in, again, not in a codependent way, um, but just in a really, really solidly compatible, supportive way. 
attraction fades. I hear this all the time, um, usually from people who aren't married. Um, not not a lot from people who are married, and certainly not ones who got married and stayed together. Um, I imagine this myth is out there because, uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, I mean, certainly there's been a lot of instability in introduced into family units, and then a lot of in unstable family units are being portrayed in media um, and kind of kind of glamorized. And um, I think a lot of people have understandably then concluded that you know people just don't get to stay attracted to each other for their whole marriage. Um, now, granted, like I said, I'm a fi like roughly 15 years into my relationship, so I can't speak for the whole rest of it, but I've observed enough people who've stayed together their whole lives. I've gotten pretty far, definitely well past any honeymoon phase or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not, that's not what happens. That's not what happens for psychologically healthy, stable people. Um, so if you find yourself constantly, you know, especially abruptly, um, losing attraction for people that you formerly, uh, were attracted to and, you know, who you can also objectively or have friends like objectively say like, this is a good person, you know, I think that's kind of a stereotypical thing that you'll see in like maybe sitcoms or, or movies or depressing naturalistic cinema, something like that. Um, if that's going on with you, that that's not healthy or normal and you have something that you need to go work out. Um, so I suggest that you do that. Now I will give one caveat to that because I have seen some evidence that there is basically a sexual variety gene um, that may have increased in prevalence recently, but it's not the majority of the population. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know that it's something you could go and test for. Um, but, you know, even if you have that predilection, I would still say that there's very likely a significant psychological angle. Um, so I would investigate that first before drawing some kind of conclusion that, you know, you're just a born slut. And my favorite objection, no one thinks about this stuff this much as people just float around and just end up with whoever and it's all very random and you're wasting your time giving people this advice. Uh, well, first of all, obviously, it is not true that no one thinks about this stuff because I do and Sig Other does. Um, so there's two counterexamples and your absolute your absolutist statement is therefore wrong. Um, but even, <laughs> even acknowledging, of course, yeah, most people don't think about this that much. I'm not talking to most people. I'm talking to the people who are listening to this channel, people who want to try and live their lives better, um, first of all. And then second of all, just because I over-intellectualize all this stuff and think things through to a ridiculous degree doesn't mean that you have to. You can just get the benefit of me thinking about this stuff too much and go ahead and implement it. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, if you're going to insist on being unthinking and mediocre and floating through life, then this channel is not for you uh, and for everyone else. I hope you guys find this helpful and interesting, and I'll talk to you next time with Wife Hunting 101 tips, courtesy of Sigather. Bye!